Morning, everybody. I'm a little confused this morning because I see um, regulars that are sitting in different seats and it's thrown there. <laughs> I'll have to scan the audience and see what's going on. Nona's way over there. Jim and Kathy, were, it's just, it's thrown me for a loop. Before I start the message this morning, I'm going to kind of piggyback on what Ray was mentioning earlier regarding the Himalayan uh, need, but it's not to do with finances, it's to do with prayer. Um, yesterday we were at my sister-in-law's memorial, Carol, that died of cancer a couple of weeks ago in uh, Northview Foursquare Church in Coquitlam. It was a packed service for her life. And as I was going in, uh, I met the pastor. I've known him for years and years and years, Pastor Barry Buzza. And we got talking, and he told me that they are very involved, which I knew to some extent, in uh, opening churches in Africa, particularly uh, the Congo area. Uh, have donated thousands upon thousands of dollars over the years and have sent uh, groups over there to uh, mentor, disciple, encourage, and literally physically build churches in the Congo. And recently, I think just very, very recently, they had supported a young Congolese man to flee Africa and to try to find freedom here in Vancouver. I don't know if any of you read or heard on the news a couple of weeks ago where a body was found washed ashore on English Bay. Anybody see that news? Okay. Three weeks ago today, the man that they brought up worshipped in that church at Barry's. Two weeks ago, he was found dead on English Bay. The report I read on the internet was that the police didn't suspect foul play. They really didn't have any other uh, leads to go on. But Barry was telling me yesterday that the police have since contacted him and the church because they had such a part in bringing him here. And uh, they suspect that he may have met up with another fellow Congolese man because witnesses down there saw the two together for a while. And they haven't been able to find the man. They suspect he may have murdered the Christian man. And he says, even though you're Christians, there's a hatred, deep, deep-rooted hatred in the Congo for fellow tribesmen and ones of other tribes. So in your prayers, just remember the church and the family of this man that the police would be able to catch the second man and try to bring some kind of closure uh, to this situation. Very, very sad things that are going on in our own streets. Here's a man that came to find freedom in our country and in a very short period of time. He's, but we know where he is. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning I want to talk on finishing well. And if I can get this right here. There we go. The title of my sermon this morning is, Unless the Lord Builds the House. And it's taken from Psalm 127, verse 1, which says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And we're going to take a look at the life of a man in Second Chronicles this morning. And we're going to see where he started well, but he didn't finish so well. But first of all, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to read from verses 6 to 11 this morning, the words of Paul the Apostle. And then we'll go and read a few verses in 2 Chronicles. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. Paul speaking says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, 
but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then if you want to turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles, we're going to be scanning that chapter so you can keep it open. Second Chronicles chapter 26. If you have been difficulty finding it, it's after King, Second Kings and before Ezra. Second Chronicles 26, verse 1. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jechaliah. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Uzziah was a remarkable man in many ways. He was born during a very tumultuous period of time in the history of the Hebrew people. And a hundred years before he became king, the foolishness of Rehoboam, who was uh, Solomon's son, tore the kingdom into two bitter enemies, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. In the following century, the countries fought constantly as evil men occupied the thrones and dominated the people. Israel's kings during this time were all reprobate pagan kings while Jerusalem's kings were somewhat godly. But eventually, the violence of the north became very commonplace in Judah. Now, I've shown here four things regarding the ones that preceded Uzziah as kings. His father, Amaziah, that we've just talked about, was assassinated by his own men. His grandfather, Joash, which we read of in 2 Kings, he fell victim to a conspiracy by his own efforts. Or sorry, by his own officers. His great-grandfather, Ahaziah, sat on the throne for only one year before he was assassinated. And his great-great-grandmother, who was Ahaziah's mother, Athaliah, reigned in his place until she was executed. So you can imagine there's four generations, the last four monarchs to sit on the throne before Uzziah were all killed before his coronation. You talk about coming into this situation. Welcome to a wicked, ugly, violent world. That's what King Uzziah knew when he was 16 years old. Imagine being 16 and being placed as king of a country. This is the example that he had. This is what he was born into. This is all he knew. It was a bloody, wicked area for Judah. Her kings were thoroughly godless. The nation would have despaired were it not for the presence of faithful prophets and priests. And the former kings never worshipped or obeyed God with a passion devotion that both David and Solomon 
had displayed. And after nine kings, Uzziah promised to be different. And history tells us that he likely reigned close to the final years of his father. As I said, Uzziah was 16 years old when he occupied the throne. And based on the chronology of Judah's kings, it appears that Amaziah was king for only six years when the people installed his son as Judah's 11th king. I want you to take a look at chapter 25, just the page before, which is the history of Amaziah, but we're not going to read it. I just want to direct you to verse 2 of 2 Chronicles 25, because this is very important as we line it up with his son Uzziah. It says that Amaziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but notice this, but not wholeheartedly. And then if you flip over to chapter 26 that we just read, notice verse 4, talking about Uzziah. Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. They both did what was right in the eyes of the Lord to start. It says of Amaziah, but not wholeheartedly. In other words, he somewhere along the lines, he went wayward. Amaziah was known to be a fence rider, a very unstable man who could not be counted on to remain consistent. He started out well, relying on the Lord's strength to defeat his enemies, in particular Judah's enemy, Edom, the Edomites. But then he began to worship their gods. And he soon forgot that it was the Lord who gave him the strength to defeat the Edomites and the other nations that he came up against. And soon after that, when he turned from the Lord, he began to pick a fight against Israel's king, Jehoash, at the time. And in, you don't need to look at it. I'll just read it for you. Two things that it says here in chapter 25. It says that after Amaziah, king of Judah, consulted his advisors, he sent this challenge to Jehoash, son of Jehobaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel. He says, come, meet me face to face. This is what Jehoash said back to him. You say to yourself that you have defeated Edom, and now you are arrogant and proud, but stay at home. Why ask for trouble and cause your own downfall and that of Judah also? Amaziah, however, would not listen for God so worked that he might hand them over to Jehoash because they sought the gods of Edom. So Jehoash is saying, stay home. It's for your own good. You don't want to pick a fight with me. He says, you're the thistle and I'm the cedar of Lebanon. Lebanon. He says, if I were you, I wouldn't trust your luck. But I'm as I had other ideas. And we read that he suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Israelites. And fed up, the people killed him and crowned his 16-year-old son to lead them. They had had enough. And he led them for 52 years. In verse 4 of chapter 26, we read the words that Uzziah did right what was in the eyes of the Lord. He began well, and the good that he did at the beginning was very reminiscent of his father, Amaziah. And the question we can ask ourselves this morning is this. That if our children follow in our steps, and they will, they will follow in our steps. Will they do what is right in the sight of the Lord? Uzziah made good tracks early on, but just like his father, he made them with a reluctant heart. 
Verse 5, it says that as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him or gave him success. And the key words there, as long as he sought the Lord. You see, if we seek the Lord, he has promised to prosper us. But many times in our life, we consider prosperity and success in the material world, in this physical world. Fame, fortune, power, strength, influence. But God has only promised to use us and to honor our efforts and in so doing to prosper us. And we need to think of it more in terms of the spiritual sense. The problem with these two kings was that they began right, but then they forgot the, it was the Lord that allowed them to have the victory and to have the success. And then they began to follow the gods of their people. They neglected the God that had brought them this far. And they thought, no, we can do it on our own. And each one of them either fell to the hands of the enemy or they were executed before their term was even up as kings. Let's take a look at five things that constituted the work of a good king, that being Uzziah. The first one is his military conquest. We see that in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 26, where we read that he went to war against the Philistines and he broke down the walls of Gath, Jabne, and Ashdod. He then rebuilt towns near Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Gerbal, and against the Meunites. He was not only a capable general, but he was a wise and compassionate statesman. He subdued the dangerous nations and turned them into peaceful neighbors by treating them with compassion. And the very words here says, God helped him. God helped him. The second thing we see is his notoriety and respect. Verse 8. The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah, and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he had become very powerful. Here we see the words fame and tribute. He became famous because what he had done, and in so doing, the neighboring countries brought him a tribute. And in the ancient world, the tribute was a form of appeasement money. It was in recognition of saying, we are so thankful for what you have done for us. We're so thankful you haven't killed us or defeated us or brought you under as slaves. We respect your power. And it's, it's like they're saying, please accept this gift as a token of our loyalty and gratitude for literally not wiping us out. And that's what they did to Uzziah. He started out well. The third thing we see is his prosperity. Verses 9 and 10. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate and at the angle of the wall. And he fortified them. He also built towers in the desert and dug many cisterns because he had much livestock in the foothills and in the plain. He had people working his fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands for he loved the soil. He was basically a farmer at heart. He made wise plans and the Lord gave him favorable results. You see, in those days, kings not only led from the throne, but they also had a very vested interest in their personal estates and growing them into something that was magnificent. He was a farmer at heart. He loved to work the soil. And to this day, you see some beautiful landscapes that appear covering the slopes of Judea. 
and it was absolutely beautiful from what I can understand in his time. And the land known as the wilderness become known as fertile land. The fourth thing we see is his power, verses 11 to 13. It says, Uzziah had a well-trained army, ready to go out by divisions according to their numbers, as mustered by Jael, the secretary, and Masai, the officer under the direction of Hananiah, one of the royal officials. The total number of family leaders over the fighting men was 2,600. Under their command was an army of 307, 5,000 men trained for war, a powerful force to support the king against his enemies. He was a very capable warrior. He had built a mass army of over 300,000 men and 2,600 leaders. And everything he did was to ensure the prosperity and the safety of his kingdom. And the fifth thing we see is the security he brought. Look at verses 14 and 15. Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows, and sling stones for the entire army. In Jerusalem, he made machines designed by skillful men for use on the towers and in the corner defenses to shoot arrows and hurl large stones. His fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. Uzziah was not the normal king when it came to warfare. He was thinking outside the box. And he was one of those kings that began to invent new ways of weaponry to use in fighting against his enemies. We see the inventiveness and the ingenuity of Uzziah. He didn't just rely on brute strength for defense, such as weapons and helmets and shields. But he he got together an array of machinery to augment the towers and strengthen the walls so that anyone even thinking of attacking Judah would be smart to change their plans. And this was all well and good. All of these five things, he started out well, but then we see in verse 15, he was greatly helped until he became powerful. What happened at that point? There's two things we see here. First of all, the pride, and then the fall. Look at verse 15. Greatly helped until he became powerful. His reputation and fame spread rapidly. His neighbors both feared and admired him. They began to assume the credit belonged to him. And before long, they began to praise him and talk about him. And the problem is that when people admire a person, they begin to tell them how great they really are. The danger isn't what the public thinks, it's what the person himself thinks. And if you hear it long, often enough, and long enough, you begin to think, I really am great, aren't I? It's just reinforced by those who admire you. And how many times have we seen seen this in, in the political realm? Over and over again. How many times have we seen it in the Christian circle? Men and associations, we each know some of them, who started out right in the eyes of the Lord, and they built their Christian organization to a point where it became an empire. And they rose with it. And people began to throw themselves. How we admire, and each one of us, we we admire men that are we consider so holy before the Lord, when we compare them to ourselves. Oh, if only we were like them. And that's where the danger lies. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3.10 that we read says, 
but each one should be careful how he builds. Paul begins to talk about that some plant, some feed, some water, and then some later on, some time, might see the results. It's not just one person. We need to be careful how we build. We can prepare the ground. We can weed it, fertilize it. But it is always the Lord who is responsible for the increase. When I was studying this, I was reminded of Saul. In his early years, Saul didn't think too highly of himself. And then God put his hand on him and he said, you are going to be the king of my kingdom. And we read in I think it's Kings where he hid himself behind the baggage when God was speaking to him. He doubted his ability to do the job and he had no desire to be in the public eye. But once the Lord got a hold of him, what a change in his life. And God was with them and before long he had a few victories on the battlefield under his belt. And before long he began to see himself as a big shot And he began to strut around as though he himself had built this and had the victory. He threw his weight around and his fame spread and he began to believe the press that he received. He gave himself a promotion and no longer satisfied of being the commander of the army of Israel he decides to become a high priest and he throws a robe over his garment and he began to prepare himself to offer sacrifices in place of the priest. And it's at that point we read that Samuel confronts him and in effect he says these words, and I'm kind of paraphrasing. Saul, when you were little in your own eyes, God could use you. But now that you are great in your own eyes, you really have become useless to him. That's what can happen. Uzziah was a remarkable man in many ways, as I said, to begin. And he was. He deserved a lot of credit for his accomplishments, but he didn't have or keep the right perspective. You see, giving... God, the glory that he deserves, does not diminish the role that we play in achieving what we have achieved. The problem comes in diminishing the credit that we give to the Lord. There's nothing wrong with us receiving some praise and adulation and taking the credit, but we, it better never exceed that which should go to the Lord himself. Again, in 1 Corinthians 3, in verse 13, Paul goes on to say this, For our work will be shown for what it truly is. It can't be hidden from God. We may fool others, but we can't fool God. It will be shown for what it truly is, because the day will bring it to light. And our work is going to be revealed with fire and it's going to test the quality of each man's work. We will not outsmart God. We cannot hide it from God. He sees our heart. And then came the fall. Verse 16. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Pride, what a killer, what a killer. Can happen to anybody. When we become strong in in our own eyes, that's when things begin to change. He failed to read history. And so, as we read earlier, he was doomed to become what his father had become. 
His father had started out right, but it said not wholeheartedly, and it eventually led to his own man killing him for what he had done. And just like his father, he started out right, but then pride also came into his life. And again, going back to people that we've admired and organizations that we have long supported financially, Ray and I were just talking recently, I'm not going to mention the name, but a few weeks ago we were talking about a man who this happened to. It literally breaks your heart. We can't fathom how a man who we would perceive had so much blessing and in our eyes would have walked so close to God could fall. And Ray used the word pride. And I think he's right. I think he's right. Let me read you three verses, all taken from Proverbs. It says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. The last one says, a man's pride brings him low. Oh, is that ever true? I felt for the family of the man that I was just referring to. I can't imagine what it did to that family. Low point. And as Christians, our first area of faithfulness is not in the workplace. It's not in the home. It's not even with our family. Our primary realm of faithfulness is to the Lord is in our hearts. Because that is what he sees. And Uzziah's reaction was, I must really be something special. There's never been a king like me. Look at my inventions, my prosperity, all these citizens who are bringing me tribute money to thank me for how good I've been. No one's had it this good since Solomon. Am I great or what? And then we see what happens. He's not satisfied with what the Lord gave him. He says, no, I'm going to actually become like God in that I am going to take the place in his holy place and take the place of the priest. His conceit convinced him that his sovereign rule wasn't just on the throne, but it included the very temple of God. And that's where he made his mistake. He stepped into a role that he had no business to be in. The role of the priest. And blinded by pride, he lost all his restraint. And he he stepped beyond the bounds of safety. A moment of clarity tells the truth about Uzziah's attitude. His conceit, his pride, his disrespect for the Lord. And just as Uzziah begins to remind them of his divine authority as king, we read here that leprosy overtook him. And 80 priests went in to try to rescue him, and he became angry with them. This is my place now. And instantly the Lord gave him leprosy. You see, God will have the final word. And nothing reduces a person to ground zero in those days than leprosy. I said this morning that I was going to speak on finishing well. We must finish well. You see, Uzziah's impressive history came to a tragic, abrupt end something he couldn't control. The Lord had helped him all along this way as they had his father Amaziah. He had prospered him, but then he presumed to take his authority to the temple. And God said, no, you don't. God's holy place 
is not a place for just any man. And God struck him down. Sometimes this reminds me of playing in an instrument, or in an orchestra. And when you begin to hear them, Doug, you can relate to this. In an orchestra, you begin to, uh, if you get there early and they're, they're warming up, and sometimes you think, oh, that, that's kind of an off note. They're struggling. They're not, they haven't warmed up. Or if you're teaching, as Doug does, t- teaching kids uh, to play the violin, boy, there's some sour notes in there. But towards the end, it all becomes fine-tuned. Finishing well after a rough start. Yesterday, in one of the eulogies of my sister-in-law, one of her friends said that an athlete in one of the past Olympics came in an hour late after everybody had, that had, was going to finish had finished and were packing up to go home, and he stumbled across the finish line. And they said to him, why did you even bother? He said, because my country did not send me to start the race. They sent me to finish the race. He started out well, but the final notes of Uzziah's performance spoiled his career. Observe how his life ended, verses 21 to 23, and with this we begin to close. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous and excluded from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. The other events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. Uzziah rested with his fathers and was buried near them in a field for burial that belonged to the kings, for people said he had leprosy, and Jotham, his son, succeeded him as king. His gravestone was marked, he is a leper, not he is a king. He was ostracized to a a separate unit because of his leprosy. His greatness was forgotten in the end. And all the people, all they could remember was how his life had ended, not how it had begun. How the final notes played out. Let me leave you with these three principles. Number one, there is no genuine success apart from the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Give God all the credit. Give him all the glory because ultimately it all comes from him. And anything that we possess is all his. All the talents, abilities we have, they all come from him. We are only a part of it, as Paul said at the beginning of chapter 3 of Corinthians. A while back I was reading an article, I can't remember what magazine it was, but it was an article by John MacArthur. One of the reporters came to his church one day. He said, I want to interview you. John said, come along. And these are the questions that the reporter asked John MacArthur, and then he asked him to answer. The reporter asked, why has this church grown? Why has it flourished? Why do so many people go there? Churches come and go, rise and fall, But what is the secret here? What is the key? What makes this church so different? This is the reply John MacArthur gave, and I quote, This church is what it is, has been what it has been, and will be what it will be in the future because of one dominating presence. That the living, eternal, triune God is a full and faithful and ever-present and active member of this church. He is the source of our life. He is the source of our influence. He is the source of our message. He is the power of our ministry. He is the motivation for our worship. It is to him we sing and pray, and for him we preach and disciple. He is the one we worship. He is the one we serve. 
and he is the power behind everything that this church has ever done for the glory of God. That's the way it should be. The second principle is this, that few tests reveal the character of a person like success. Success does not ruin a person. Success reveals the character of a person. Number three, the God who blesses is also the God who can break. I put in there, don't bite the hand that feeds you. Our God is a God of grace. He will always give us more than we deserve. However, God is more concerned about our holiness than he is about our happiness. And if his blessing doesn't get the job done, then he has little choice but to chastise us. And the Lord wants to bless us beyond all that we can ever imagine. If only we begin well and we finish well. As long as we give him all the credit and all the glory that he deserves. In closing, I'm just going to, you don't need to turn to it. I'm going to just read you the words of Paul to the church at Ephesus. I want you to take note of the times that the word power and love is used here in these short verses. Taken from Ephesians chapter 3 that we may be able to end this morning with these thoughts for our church. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You see, it's the power of God that is at work by his Holy Spirit in us for the benefit of the church. I'm encouraged every Sunday when I see the gifts being displayed. Thank you, Young, for leading us this morning at the Lord's table. All coming together. One waters, one feeds, one weeds, one fertilizes. But it's God that gives the increase. May we never, ever not finish well. Let's pray. Father, this morning, this has been a solemn reminder to ourselves to ask these questions of our own life. Father, sometimes it's very difficult to not take pride in our accomplishments, whether it be with our family, raising them. It could be in our workplace that we've built something great. It could be in ministry. It could be in so many areas. And we can fall prey to the glory that sometime is heaped upon us. Help us, Lord, to remain humble. Help us to check our pride. Help us to be cognizant that we are what we are because of what you have done first and foremost for us and who you are that you have given us everything in life, including our salvation. And we thank you for that. And we, may we always, in all things, bring you the glory in everything that we do and everything that we say. We thank you for this time together this morning in fellowship, worshiping you. We thank you for the opportunity of having the open doors once again, that we can gather together in freedom and sing your praises. 
We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit amongst us here today. And we give you all the honor and the glory that you are so deserving of. For it is in your mighty name that we pray. Amen.